I know you could quote this by memory. Very powerful scripture. It's kind of sobering. Uh, in a good way, though, I, I'll quote it from the King James Version, Psalm chapter 90, verse 12. Lord, teach us to number our days, that we may apply our heart to wisdom. That we may apply our heart to wisdom. Some translations read that we may have an open heart, that we, that we may have a wise heart, that we may have a, a, a wise and discerning spirit. Whatever translation you're reading and following, uh, bottom line, the, 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 point is, the point is this, Lord, we only have a certain amount of days in our entire life, but let's just not stretch it to that point. Let's just focus on this given year right now, right? So this given year, we have, yeah, what, what I, was my map correct earlier? 359 days left? Yeah, yeah. 359 days left, yeah, because we're not in leap year this year, right? 359 days left in this given year, of course, not, not including the, the remaining portion of what we have today. 359 plus year uh, days left so what we need to understand is we need to make every day count we need to make every day count each passing year i'm becoming more cognizant of the reality that time is short that there is a brevity of life i've conducted many 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 funerals over the time i've been in ministry and it, it's always sobering to realize that how brief life is, even if someone has lived to be in their 80s or even 90s, still life is extremely short. James puts it this way in the book of James, that what is our life? It is as a vapor which appeareth for a moment and then vanishes away. So in, in light of eternity, our time here is extremely, extremely short. Now that everyone is depressed, let me focus on this. But really, it shouldn't depress us. What it should do is propel us. It should propel us to realize and utilize every single day. One thing I'm realizing is more and more, I, I, I knew this when I was younger, but I really understand it fully now, is the most important, the most important commodity we have, the most viable and precious and priceless commodity we have, other than, of course, the saving grace of Jesus Christ, in our life, is time. It is not money. Everyone should have said amen on that. I'm not denouncing money, not renouncing in my life. We're clear, right? Neither should you. We need it. But time is more important. You can get money back. You can get that money back. You can get the friends back. You can get the relationships back. You, you, you can get all that stuff back. You can get the job back. You can get the car back. You can get the house back. You can get all that stuff back. That's just material stuff that, bottom line, the end of the day, well, you know, I'm not talking about covenant relationships with people, but, you know, working relationships, all that kind of stuff, everything else I mentioned, you can get all that stuff back, easy, no problem, right? But you can't get time back. So Moses here is saying, at the end of his days, basically, he's saying, Lord, teach us to number our days, that we may apply our heart to wisdom. I, I like the, the King James Version there most accurately because, really, we need to apply our hearts to wisdom. Wisdom is really nothing more than the proper application of knowledge. So you kind of get this twofold understanding here. Moses is saying the latter stanza of that scripture is that, Lord, teach us to use and utilize this knowledge that we have that we can apply it properly and be children of wisdom. Jesus even said that, that wisdom is justified of our children, meaning if you have wisdom, you, you not only possess it, but you purvey it. It's justified, justifiable, and also even manifested in those who have it. It's, it's actually a sign of God's children. We should be wise, right? Should be wise as, okay, we need to keep going though. Harm is of, wise serve harm as doves even. So the, you know, we, need to be, we need to be wise people. So we're utilizing this wisdom. We're applying this wisdom in the, in the aspect of our days. Every single day is important. Make the most of it. So without any further ado, speaking of time, let me give you some do's and don'ts for 2019. Now, you don't have to do any of these. You don't have to apply any of it. I'm not going to lose sleep if you do or don't. It's not going to bother me if you do or don't. Now, I probably shouldn't say this, but there is empirical evidence. It's really interesting how it's gathered. Is that as a whole, society as a whole, when they set in be it a lecture or a university class, bottom line, only about 3% actually apply it and live it. And I find that true. You, really, you can extrapolate that in the body of Christ. It's very true. Because that, that percentile ratio of people who really know their Bible really know their, and really apply as much as they possibly can, 
it, it, it's very small in all actuality. So, so see, we at CIC, we're in the 3% of the entire world. Anyway, I just gave you a humongous, gargantuan compliment. Tell somebody I'm in the 3%. But anyway, so, but anyway, because you guys applied us. There again, that's why back in the book of James, we, we shouldn't be hearers of the word only. You know, we are to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if we're hearers only, the word of God goes on to say, we deceive ourselves. We actually are living a life of deception if we only hear this stuff and not do it. But I, so I know you're going to do this stuff, right? Now, this is my abstract, some ways, a little bit every now and then kind of off the wall, but it really has spiritual import to help you have a phenomenal 2019, laying the foundation for what we're really going to begin to look at next week for a series, okay? First and foremost, this is where it all begins. How many, let me ask the question. How many of you want a phenomenal 2019? I know the question. Had to ask it. Here's what you need to do first. Read your Bible every day. Point number one, numero uno, read your Bible every day. Amen. Point number dos, <laughs> Just wanna, pray every day. Amen. Okay, see, those are the only points I have. We are dismissed. Ushers, let's receive the tithe and offering. We're out of here. I'm done. You're looking at me funny. I really shouldn't go on. That's really, if we did that, if we did that and really did that every day this year, you will have a much, much better than you can even imagine. Amen. Now, now, okay, I'm not saying this to you guys because by and large, the vast majority, the vast majority, around that 97 plus percent actually, the vast majority of Christians are not going to read their Bible every year, every day this year. The vast majority of Christians, they're, they're not going to pray every day this year. They're just not going to for a wide variety of reasons, not going to go into and trail off into so listen, if you really want to set your life apart, and if you really want to set this year apart, if you will, like never before, read your Bible every day and pray every day, you are going to embark upon the greatest faith adventure of your life. The notes I wrote down said there will be such a roar right now, a thunderous applause and shouts of, of exclamation and affirmation. People will be actually running up and down the aisles doing somersaults and backflips. So I'm waiting for that. Read your Bible every day. If you don't have a, a through the Bible in one year kind of outline, you know, you don't need to go and buy that Bible that's, you know, that's kind of dictated that way, if you will. You can use your own Bible, but, what, but you need to get on a plan. Already, you should have started, of course, January 1st. I really, I, I, I need all year just to go on that. Just read your Bible every day, pray every day. It'll change your year. I promise you that. Just spend that time. If it's easiest, do it first thing in the morning. Or if it's, if it's easier, do it, you know, sometime midday. If it's, if it's easier, you know, end your day that way. Personally, I, I, I start my day and end my day with the word and prayer. I and I read a lot of books. Many times, you know, I, I'm reading several books at a time, which I save that most of the time. Sometimes, if I can, I'll, I'll try to get a little bit throughout the day. But I read. I, I like to at least spend that last hour of my day reading the books that, I, that I'm into, taking notes on them. But the last book I read, of course, I read it even earlier in the day and all of that. But the last book I read every day is the Word. I end my day with the Word of God. I want to start my day with the Word of God and end my day with the Word of God. It bookends my day because it bookends my life as it does yours. So anyway, read your Bible every day. Pray every day. I can't say that enough. Really, just do it. Turn, turn to a few people and say, J just do it, and your, and your year will be better. Say that to them. Just do those two things. Your, your year will be better. Believe me, it will. It will change your life. It will change your life. It'll change. I mean, come on. You know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Amen. You, you can't live from Sunday to Sunday. Amen. You can't live from Sunday to Sunday by hearing the word. It has to be every day. It's every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God every single day of your life, right? Make sure you're praying every day. Start out, simple as this. Start out with five minutes a day. 
Next week, kick it into 10. Following week, kick it into 15. By the end of the month, that last week of that month, you got, you know, designate 20 minutes a day of prayer. It's so easy. I mean, come, oh, I got to go on. I got to go on. You, do's and don'ts in 2019 also. Point number three is ask why. This year, you need to ask why like never before. Ask why. Meaning, learn something new this year. Ask why. Gain more information. Gain more knowledge. Gain more understanding in your life. Ask why. Why? Not just, not just you know, always find the why behind. Behind what, Pastor? Behind that. Behind that issue. Behind that thing. Behind that historical issue you, you just read. Ask the why. Find out the why. Find out the why about every single thing. You, 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 should, you should have this constant, constant motion moving in your mind, in your spirit even, of asking why. Ask why. Ask why. Um, bam, this just came up. Uh, the other day, my, my wife and I was looking at certain things to finish up the house and design this and that, you know, and all that and all that, which that's her department. And, and then I, I, I put in my five cents worth and all that. And, and we're just talking about different things. And, you know, uh, the silent shaker cabinets are, you know, you know, kind of the thing in, in, in some aspects, you know, shaker cabinets. And I have been for the last few years, kind of still that, that trendy thing uh, of kitchen. And, and, you know, we were talking about that. And I said, but the other thing about it is, but she knew the, all this too, though, because uh, sometimes she just has to listen to hear me tell the same historical account again and again and again. God gave her a lot of grace for that. But anyway, so we're talking about that, you know, shaker and all. So I just started talking about the history of the shaker cabinets even. Shaker cabinets and shaker homes. I don't know ever ever even studied the historical background behind that, but it's very interesting. And what, you know, because I kind of laugh, you know, I'll hear people talk about, oh, shaker cabinets, especially, you know, a few years ago when they're really kind of the, the trend of certain kitchens, and they're talking about it like it's new. I was like, you know, and, and, and sometimes I would say, well, yeah, new, uh, going all the way back to the uh, 17th century. It, it's just brand new. Been around since the 17th century. And then, of course, when you understand not their architectural design in their homes and the group of people who they were. They were Holy Ghost-filled people. One of the reasons why they were called shakers is because they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and the manifestations that occurred when they would meet on Sundays and other given times, the power of God would come upon them so much that they would shake. And, and, and they, they were, you know, today you, you'd almost call them minimalist. You would almost call them simplistic in their styles, design, and architecture and all of that. They were craftsmen through and through. They could have built everything, but they just wanted to keep things simple, clean lines, simple, very functional, because those, that's the life they lived. But you begin to, you know, you know if, if you don't ask a why, you never know anything. You should always ask the why about everything. Why? When you go to a restaurant and order, you know, ask why. No, 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 why? No, 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 why? You know, ask, ask, get information about it. You were talking about, okay, oh, I got to keep going. I got so much. Got to keep going. Ask why not. Ask why not. People tell you you can't do it. Ask why not. The enemy starts telling you you can't do it. Ask why not. Conventional wisdom says, oh, you shouldn't do that now. Ask why not. Because conventional wisdom says, oh, this isn't the time yet. You, know, you, you should probably wait for, for the stars to line up, I guess. You know what? The stars are never going to line up. Nothing's ever going to be perfect to go out and launch into a new venture in your life, whatever that venture is. You need to ask why not. When people tell you you can't or it can't be done or you'll never achieve that, ask why not. 2019 should be the year of asking why not. Turn to somebody and say, why not? Why not? Why can't it be done? Why can't you do that? Why can't you launch out into that? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Because when you start asking why not, you, you alleviate and actually you, you, con- you completely destroy that victim mentality. Instead of blaming someone else and instead of finding excuses, you're too young, you're too old, you're not smart enough, you're a woman or you're a man or you're black or you're the wrong color. There's no such thing as wrong color. The death, oh my, 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 my. You just got to ask yourself, why not? Why not? Who said I can't do that? Who said I can't achieve that? Who said I can't accomplish that? Who said I'm too old? Who said I, okay, so, oh, why not, why not, why not? Somebody just say, well, ask why not. Ask why not. 
Every day this year, you should be asking why and why not every single day. You got a dream this year. I mean, I know this is a given. We're going to really talk about that more in the ensuing weeks beginning next week. But you got a dream. You have to dream like never before. I don't want to open that up very much because I'm going to say that for next week and the weeks following. But you have to dream. Get a dream. Hold on to that dream. If your dream didn't come to pass last year, guess what? Bring it into this year and believe that this year is the year your dream is going to come to pass. Oh, somebody say, I'm going to dream like never before. Also, you need to dream. You also have to believe. You got to believe in your dream, of course. You got to believe as a whole. You know, you can write, if you're taking notes, uh, you can write believe slash faith. Have faith. Strengthen your faith this year. Hmm, how do you strengthen your faith? Hmm, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 makes it very clear, right? So read the Word of God. Back to that, right? Back to point number one. Read the Word of God every day. You'll be, you're, you will believe like never before. You'll have faith like never before. It is a prerequisite for you to have faith like never before every day this year. Yesterday's faith is stale. You need today's faith. That's why there's a reason why in Hebrews 11 it says now faith. Now granted, in the original rendering... No numerical demarcation between chapter 10 to 11. So, you know, someone said, well, that was just a, a, a transitionary uh, word there put to bring the focus back into, into faith now. Well, yes, but not all yes, because that word also brings it up to date, that your faith needs to be up to date. Now faith. Yes, transitional, because now we're going to focus on faith, but also not only focus on faith, we need to focus on now faith. Yesterday's faith is stale. That's why you need to renew yourself every day in God's Word, which replenishes and renews your faith every day. You need to believe this year like never before. Your faith should be stronger. Look what God brought you through last year. Let me ask you a question. Are you still here? Did you make it through? Did He provide for you? Did He bless you? Did He give you the grace when you needed the grace? Did He give you the comfort when you needed the comfort. Did he give you whatever you needed? He gave you that at that point in time, right? You made it through another year. You need to elbow somebody right now and remind them you made it through another year. You made it through. You are here today by God's destiny. You are here today by divine appointment. You didn't just stumble in and stagger and say, well, you know, I think I'll go today. God pre-orchestrated you to be here today so he would use me to tell you, have faith that this year is going to be better than you could even imagine. Amen. Slap somebody and say, believe like never before this year. And then the next point about 2019 is don't stop believing. So when you start believing, don't stop believing. Faith gives you momentum. Only doubt stops that momentum. Faith gives you this divine propulsion to get you to where you need to be to receive more of God's promises. There again, only doubt, of course, worry, which is the first cousin, the first inbred cousin of doubt. As they begin to work on you, if you allow them to, they begin to stifle that propulsion in your life. They begin to attack that momentum in your life. Faith will always keep you moving in the right direction. Sometimes you, you might not even know what direction you should be going, but you know that ain't the right direction. So as long as you're moving away from the, from the previous area that, that was uh, non-beneficial to you, you're moving in the right direction. As long as you're moving toward the things of God, you're moving in the right direction. So don't stop that momentum. Don't stop believing. Once you start believing whatever God has in store for you, you start believing in the, in the God-given dream He has given you. When you start believing that things are going to turn out better for you, uh, for your, your, your marriage, for your children, for your finances, 
for the gift, the grace, the calling, the anointing on your life that have been maybe somewhat dormant, that you start believing that God's going to resurrect those gifts like never before and use you and fellowship with you in a way that you can't even imagine that he's going to use you to bless people like never before. So, so when, when, when you start believing, don't stop believing. Some of you almost stopped believing in 2018 when things kind of got a little sideways and a little shipwrecked in your life. Listen, God dusted you off and cleaned you out, cleaned you off and pushed you into a new year to let you know, don't stop believing because what I started, I will finish being confident of this very thing. He who has begun, he who has started a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Somebody say, don't stop believing, don't stop believing, don't stop believing. Here's another thing you got to do for 2019. You got to notice you have to take notice. Oh, I'm serious. I need eight weeks for this. We live in a society that notices nothing beyond their phone. They notice nothing beyond their phone. I find it alarming. I find it unsettling and even upsetting. If you will really notice this, go to any venue of your choosing, excluding bars. Go to any venue of your choosing. Go to any restaurant, any resort. Wherever it is, what are people doing in this wonderful surrounding they're in? They are, they are electronically possessed. Now, that's mine. You like that? I like it, too. That's mine, so don't steal it. If you do, give me credit. So if you tweet or text that, say, I heard this from Pastor. But anyway. If you put that on social media, you get give you some credit, right? Anyway, so they are electronically possessed. That's been proven. Sociologists are proving it. Psychiatrists are proving it. They don't use that term, of course. But it's like, really? I have been in some nice, nice places, beautiful places, beautiful places. And people don't even notice what's around them. Now, this is easy for me to do. It's just natural for me to do, especially nice places opulent settings, I notice what type of flooring I'm standing on. I notice the furnishings, the type of wood that's used. If there was some metal that's been fabricated, hand fabricated by a modern day blacksmith that I can tell that was hand forged and that was not machined. I can tell the difference. I see stuff like that and look at the detail of that. It's so easy for me to go anywhere and notice the trees. What type of trees? It's so easy for me to notice that kind of stuff. It's so easy for me to, wherever we're at, we go to hotels, we go to resort or whatever, I just notice all of that. And, I'm, and I'll be around a lot of people, and they're just sitting there looking at their phone. I want to go take the phones away, and I want to say, will you take notice? You paid this money. And you are stuck to that little device that's getting all of your focus and all of your attention. Well, I got to do business. Oh, right. You ain't that. Oh, I can't. Okay, I got to go. Okay, let me say focus. Let me, let me say focus. I'll say nice. Yesterday, we were at a place, my family and I, along with friends, we at a place. And, um, you know, I just take a notice. Been there several times, many times, but I've taken more notice. And uh, off in the distance, which I see the four peaks, and I, and your memories start coming back. I remember it was my Uncle Bob, and I even told that story to my family and my friends who were gathered right there. I told him the story after the fact that it was my Uncle Bob who pointed the four peaks out to me when I was about seven years of age. We were fishing in Roosevelt Lake. 
And he, you know, he thought it was very important that I know those landmarks, if you will. Of course, my dad did the same thing while growing up here. You know, that's this, that's this, that's this, you know. And uh, anyway, so I'm standing there, and I see there's snow on the four peaks of yesterday. And uh, I called. I didn't say anything. I, I, I called my family and friends over there. I said, I, I said come here, guy. Come here. Come here and stand right here. I said, just come on over here. I said, this will be worth it. This will be worth it. Come over here and stand right here. So I waited. I got over there. And like, you know, I said, oh, I wonder what dad's saying now. I wonder what he's doing now. What are we doing now? <laughs> no, not really. I, I am so thankful. My children, they just love and respect me. And they always know when I do something like that, when I say time out on something, it's going to be important. So I brought them all over close, gathered up. I said, okay, we ready? I said, everyone look right there. Look right there. Do you see that? Stunning. Four peaks, Captain Snow. Absolutely stunning. Because they, 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 they took my breath away and they got my attention there again. Go, go down memory lane and all that and all that. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just enjoying. I'm taking in God's handiwork. I'm taking in God's handiwork. Enjoying it immensely. And so then, because I noticed that, I call them over. I want them to notice. I call all of them over. Everyone look. And they probably said, okay, what now? But I, finally, I said, just take notice of that. Because I knew I was going to bring this point out today. Take notice of that. How many of us, we drive by Camelback Mountain, we don't even notice it. We, we, we drive by. We drive through some of the most beautiful Sonoran Desert in the world. Which I, I know you know this, but you know, saguaros can only grow in certain, and, and it's actually overall, as, as far as land mass compared to the world, and a, and a very small land mass compared to the entire world. You don't find saguaros in European countries. You don't find saguaros in any of the deserts in other parts of the world. Some of the vegetation that we have here, of course, running down in the Sonora Desert, and, and of course, down in, the ba in Baja Peninsula, you can't find it anywhere. And we walk, we walk by saguaros, especially when they're in bloom, we don't even take notice. Now, some are saying, Pastor, will you get on to the next point? No. <laughs> That's my point here. We don't take notice. Have you ever noticed this in the Bible? How many times did Jesus tell his disciples, take notice? Now, this, this is the different version, different translation. This is how he said in the King, King James Version. Consider. Consider lilies of the field. Consider the, consider the birds of the air. Consider, consider. How many times would he say that? Sermon on the Mount alone, how many times did he say that? Consider, consider, consider. Did you ever notice this? He's standing, because they, they had already tithed and given their offering. He's standing in the area where the weekly tithe and offering is being collected. He's standing there, and if you read the narrative real close in the Bible, it says that, gee, of course, you know, nothing gets by on him anyway. And he notices, he notices... He notices this elderly widow lady living on an extreme, extreme limited income. And she goes by and she drops in two mites, which equals approximately our currency today, fluctuates a little bit, depending on the rise of gold and all of that. Bottom line, it's about one-fourth of one penny. Today's currency, what she drops in to give. Jesus noticed that. And he brings that up to his disciples. The reason why Jesus was always ahead of the curve and the reason why he could use everything from nature to people's condition of life is because he took notice. He wasn't on his stinking phone. He took notice of people in need. He took notice of things. He rebuked his disciples for not taking notice when you read the narrative close enough. And when you really begin to take notice, it will revolutionize your life. It will open you up to a world that you didn't even know existed. Can I help you with this? You know one of the reasons that people can't compliment others other than them being jealous and envious? It's because they haven't taken notice of what went into what that person did. 
They didn't take notice of the hard work they, they put, of the sacrifice they put in. They haven't taken notice, there again, because also, if we're not careful, we can all be very narcissistic and self-centered and egocentric, right? And there again, and some people deal with jealousy and envy, you know, so they, so they purposely don't notice. They don't want to say anything because of those demonic dilemmas in their life. But we pray that everyone get delivered from those. Everyone say amen, right? But bottom line, people don't notice when someone just like this. This is no connection. This has no connective tissue to anyone past, present, or I'm sure even future in this church. Everyone say amen to that, right? I don't preach a minister that way. But like when someone has you over for a meal, if it is a fried bologna sandwich on white bread with mayo and mustard and sliced onion and Kool-Aid poured in a mason jar, Chairs that don't, miss, that don't match, plates that don't even match. If they invite you over for that, you ought to take notice and acknowledge the work, the sacrifice, and time that they went through to have you there. You ought to take notice enough to thank them for what they've done. There again, it's, it's like this, and I, oh, I'll go ahead and say it. I'm not bragging on myself. It's just because I've learned this over the years and been applying it. Haven't always done it. Matter of fact, I, I used to be very, very uh, different in this area. But you know one of the reasons why I'm so thankful? There's several reasons. One of the reasons I'm so thankful that you're here on Sundays. And on rare occasion, you know, other than vacation or on rare occasion, you're not here. One of the reasons why I thank you for being here one of the reasons why, you know, before service, after service, we talk a little bit, say, man, it's all good to see you and all that and all that. I mean that for the bottom of my heart. But you, 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 know, you, know, you know what's happened as I've gotten a little wiser in, in pastoring? As I realize the sacrifice it takes for people to get to church, especially if you have children, especially if you're married, you're raising children, and you get in an argument before you come here. <laughs> see, I take notice of all that. Brother, you said it, I didn't. He said, I've been there, so I ain't. But anyway, <laughs> brother, for what it's worth, if you want to have a great year, I'd stop with those comments. But anyway, <laughs> no, I'm messing. I'm, we're just messing here. We're just having fun. But I take notice. Some of you drive a long way. The painters drive a long way. The Vegases drive a long way. The Brooks drive a long way. I say, well, Pastor, well, how far they drive? Well, I don't want to tell you where they live because they might not want you at their house. But anyway, <laughs> that's not true. Just, just keeping the humor here. So anyway, anyway, they drive a long way. And then many of you have children. You had to get them ready. Some of you, they're your grandchildren. You get them ready and bring them to church. I take notice of that. I don't specifically tell you, hey, I take notice of but it touches me. It humbles me. It makes me thankful to know that I have people in my life who love God that much, who love this church that much, and who have respect for the covenant ship we have here, that they go through a lot of work, a lot of sacrifice to get here 99% of the Sundays of a given year. I think we need to applaud each other on that as I applaud all of you. Tell a few people around you, just take notice, just take notice. It causes you to be more appreciative. It causes you to be kinder. It causes you just to, you know, just to take notice of all things. Oh, I got to keep going. My, 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 my. I'm going to go real fast. Read. Read like never before. Do something you've never done. You want to have a great 2019? Do something you've never done. Whatever it is. Do something you've never done. If it's skydiving, we'll go skydiving. If you really, I mean, if you just really, you are hell-bent on skydiving. <laughs> we'll pray for you before you go, but just do something you've never done. Go somewhere you've never gone. And not just literally, but figuratively, spiritually. Go Take your spirit where it's never gone. Take your faith where it's never gone. Take the anointing in your life where it's never gone. Go somewhere where you have never gone before. Yes, you know, literally too. 
be it a vacation, be it things of that nature. Just go somewhere you've never gone before. Don't eat pointed French fries. Now, this is about as abstract as I'll get. This is a personal issue of mine. I refuse to eat pointed French fries. Now, stay with me on this. Now, now first of all, let me, let me give a little backstory here. Let me give you a little, you know, because I, anyway. First of all, I, beginning the first of last year, I dramatically reduced, even several years ago, I started reducing my consumption of potatoes. Last year, I learned several things about potatoes, and I thought I knew quite a bit about them. Long story short is this. I rarely eat potatoes anymore. If I do, if, if, if I'm preparing them, my wife's preparing them, they're only Yukon gold because they have less starch in them. Because it has been proven, empirical evidence by neuroscientists, and neurologists, of course, too, neurobiologists have proven that a potato contains, it's really high in what is referred to as beta amyloid protein. It has been proven that beta amyloid proteins, of course, large amounts of them, they, they contribute to dementia and Alzheimer's. The reason why is because the starches, which the word amyloid, which is a, a, a Latin word actually, which means starch. So potatoes, especially russet potatoes, they have the highest form of starch in potatoes. So you should never eat russet at least. And really, you should limit your... See, I'm, I'm, I'm helping you right here, and I'm not even going to charge you any extra. But anyway, because what happens, those starches build up over time, and just like, you know, of course, mass consumption of red meat, it begins to clog, clog the arteries. So one of the things that neurobiologists have discovered, neuroscientists have discovered, is that an overconsumption of beta amyloid proteins, they begin to block synapses. You know, synapses, by and large, it's the bridge from neuron to neuron that causes you to think, causes you to have memory, short-term, long-term, mid-term memory, causes you to even learn new things, explore new things in your mind, okay? And then, of course, you retain all that. So when, when, when those neurons become, become, like a better term, clogged, if you will, the synapses actually becomes clogged because they, they can't bridge. The neurons can't talk to each other. They can't bridge because there's this clogged, link here that, that they're not firing and they're not receiving, your neurotransmitters aren't doing their job, bottom line. Now, yes, I do have, a, I used to be a neurosurgeon before I started pastoring. But anyway, so, so I, I rarely eat potatoes. When I do on a, just a couple times a year, a few times a year, my control, we make sure they are at least Yukon gold. Costs a little bit more, but they are at least lower in starch, therefore lower in beta amyloid proteins, Right. But on rare occasion, when I do go and I, and I get some French fries, at only, only two places I will eat French fries. I won't mention those places because I don't want all you guys going there because I want to go there and not wait in line. But anyway, <laughs> so just a few times a year max, I will go there and order French fries with that item. And the thing about it is, though, I will not eat pointed French fries. Two reasons. One is the reason I mentioned from a dietary issue, right? Because if I'm going to eat these, I want the best of the best. Now, from a, from a fi figurative sense here, this is why I don't eat pointed French fries, is because there are enough things I have to do in my life that I don't want to do, that I don't like to do, that I don't want to consume, if you will. But I have to because it's called life. Have you ever discovered sometimes being an adult isn't all that fun? And have you also discovered, really discovered, that being a responsible adult isn't always all that fun? We got some honest people here. God bless all the honest people. Sometimes being a responsible adult isn't all that glamorous, isn't it? I, my daughter, Elizabeth, she puts it this way. She said, you know, adulting isn't all that fun sometimes, is it? I said, I know. But anyway, so, see, there are enough pointed ends that I have to deal with in life. So when it comes down to it, when I can discard the pointed ends, I'm going to discard the pointed ends. Literally off my French fries and figuratively, metaphorically off of my life. So if there are things that I can remove the pointed ends and remove from my life, I'm going to do it. 
For what that's worth, if you'll do it in 2019, it will free you up so much. Just you pinch off the pointed ends because when we go to that, that one place, they serve a great French fry, but they, a lot of them are pointed. I don't like the pointed ends. I want my ends to be squared off because those pointed ends are too crunchy. And I don't like that taste. I don't like the texture in my mouth. I want a potato that, that's semi-firm. I don't, I don't want, while I'm eating a semi-firm French fry, I don't want something crunchy in there at the same time. And because those crunchy ends don't taste as good. So I take them off. And at the end of the meal, my family noticed this about over a year ago. James, my son, did. He said, he said, why? And he took a picture of it after I explained to him. He took a picture. I have this pile of pointed French fries. He said, what's that? I said, what? I thought everything I'd eaten everything. What? He said, what? What, what your, those french fries you haven't eaten? I said, I ate all my french fries. He said, no, those ends. Oh, I said, oh, the pointed ends. I said, oh, yeah, I don't eat, I don't eat pointed french fries, pointed ends of french fries. And he started laughing, why not? And he said, can I eat them? I said, help yourself. <laughs> Knock yourself out. So I explained to him, I said, I said, life is too short to eat pointed french fries. Life is too short to eat pointed French fries. I'm not going to do it. Because you see, every now and then, and sometimes in a given week, sometimes too much in a given week, at least uh, uh, every now and then in a given month, you got to deal with some crunchy things that you don't like. God bless Deacon Painter down here and Elder Villegas. That's, that's why they're in leadership. They're backing me up here. They know where I'm coming from. Come on, come on. Sometimes there are those crunchy, and you ever notice that those crunchy ends on those french fries? They get lodged between your tooth and gum. And it's like, what in the world? There's no nutritional value. Matter of fact, they're destroying your mental acuity. So if I'm going to eat something that kind of harbors on clogging my mental synapses, I want it to at least taste good. It's like if I'm going down, I at least want to enjoy what I'm doing. So anyway, turn to somebody and say, life's too short to eat pointed French fries. You got to do this this year, which we're kind of doing right now, and that's laugh. You got to laugh. Tell somebody, you got to laugh. Lighten up and laugh. I get nervous around people who don't laugh. I can't hang with people who don't laugh. I can't come in covenant with people who don't laugh. People say, well, well, did Jesus ever laugh? Yes, he laughed. Absolutely, he laughed. God laughed. He laughs every day. Sometimes he laughs at us. Can you believe what they just did? <laughs> so God has a sense of humor. As the old adage goes, God has a sense of humor because he created you and me. Come on. So just learn to laugh this year. Lighten up and laugh. A merry heart, meaning a, a heart filled with laughter, does good like a medicine. People can get set free from illnesses if you just laugh, man. Just, just learn to laugh. Learn to laugh. Oh, I, I got to keep going. Next week, remind me. Shout it out even. Just, just remind me, okay? If, if I'm wrapping things up next week and I forget, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try to come back and elaborate a little bit more on laugh. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you about, if I forget, I want to tell you about, and there again, somebody around me even before service, I'm going to tell you about Mike, and I'll phrase it this way, laugh like Mike. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at ciclive.com.